The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at www.dallasgenealogy.org. Thank you. Well, Lisa Ross is our Director of Education, and she's at the Roots Tech Conference uh, this week with several of our other board members. So I get the opportunity to meet, to introduce to you our speaker today. Jim Thornhill is qualified to speak to us today because several reasons. He's been researching his family for the last 15 years, three of those years as a professional genealogist. Jim is chief researcher for Heroes of the Past, a company that seeks to delight clients provide context in our ancestors' lives and show how we all have heroes in our pasts. Jim is a graduate of the ProGen Professional Genealogy course and the Genealogy Proof course and has been awarded the Bertie Monk Holslaw Scholarship to the Institute of Genealogical and Historical Research. Jim is an active member of the Association of Professional Genealogists, the Texas State Genealogical Society, and the Dallas Genealogical Society, where Jim serves as our IT administrator. Jim, I just have to thank you for that. <laughs> we appreciate that. He is also uh, the vice president in charge of programming for the Rockwall Genealogical Society. Jim is a native Texan who has been living in the Dallas area all of his life. And his roots in Texas go back to the pre-Civil War time. Both he and his wife Judy's family came to Texas in the same way that he talks about in his presentation today called Migration through the South. Would you all join me in welcoming our speaker, Jim Thornhill. I met that guy that Patty was talking about. He's a really nice guy. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today, so you're going to have to put up with me. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and thank you for having me here today while we talk about a little bit about, about migration. migration. Well, well, let me answer a question for you that for a lot of you are thinking, thinking um, my, my question, question is, is this is migration, migration to the American South, South that this whole well, my ancestors, ancestors kind of came to the Midwest, Midwest. My, my ancestors went to the West, West Coast. Coast. Well, a lot, a lot of what we've been talking about, about works for the, the West Coast, Coast and the Midwest, Midwest as well. The only the difference, difference is in the Northern Midwest, they did a lot of work with canals, and I don't really talk about that. But there's a book in your uh, handout but called, called uh, History of Travel America that will go into detail about that. So if you had ancestors in that part of the country been interested in the work they did with canals, you can visit that. So I'd like to talk about migration in three different ways today. I'd like to talk first about how our ancestors migrated to America. Let, let, we'll talk a little bit about what they went through when they came to this country. Then spend the ball of our time talking about migration across America. And then we'll wind up talking about how, if we don't have any evidence or any proof, how we may maybe theorize or maybe get a yes at how our ancestors might not travel from the East Coast or wherever their ancestors were native landed on this continent to, on this continent to their current location. So when our ancestors, so when our ancestors, um, or all of our ancestors, um, or all of our ancestors, actually, ancestors left where they, they were, left where they were, they were coming whether from Asia they were coming from, from Asia in the West, or whether they were coming from Europe. Unless, you, unless, unless, your, ancestors you, unless your ancestors were Native, were Native American, Native American, they got on American, they got on a small boat, boat, boat across a very large body of water to get, 
to get and out. It was here. not a fun trip. It was trip. not a fun the trip. Was the the water was bad. bad. The water was um, bad. The belts were about 200, the were about 200 feet long, as opposed to a cruise ship, which was around 1,200. So it was just not. So it was just not a fun experience for them. This is a cross section. This is a cross section. What is called what, what is called package what is called a package ship, and it was a ship that was designed for bringing passengers over to this country. This you, can see the you can see the top two decks here. Top two decks are here basically are just a series, basically of, just a series of bunk beds. Each one of these beds, each one of these beds for people, people, depending on how much, much money, money you have. Um, oftentimes, the the pads uh, up there would not get close, so if they had a storm of water, water washed in it down, down the deck, deck throughout the passenger compartment, and soak everything, everything in there. there. So, so it was not a real fun environment. We have a Diary that was kept by a man, man named Gottlieb Mottelberger, who, who came over in October of 1750, and he described the trip over, and he said, during the voyage, there is on board these ships terrible misery, stench, fumes, horror, vomiting, many kinds of seasickness, fever, dysentery, headache, heat, constipation, boil, scurvy, cancer, mouth rot, and the like, all of which come from old and sharply salted food, and, and meat, meat also from very bad and foul water, water so that many die miserably. And actually, actually the statistics were that, that if you got on one of these ships to come over to America, 30% of the people that got on board would not live through the journey. So, so it was just, it wasn't, you know, it was hop on the boat and go over to America. It was a, um, it was a not, not good. good. And, 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 and even though the people, Communications weren't what they, they were today. today. You, you know, know people, when they started this journey, they had to know what they were getting into. So, so the question arises, why did they come? come? Why, why did they leave their homes in, in Europe, even though they may not have been the greatest place, place in the world? Why did they leave that, leave what, what they had established to come all the way over this journey and face the possibility? I mean, 30%, that's if you had a man and a woman and three kids, Chances are one, one of them was not going to survive our trip, trip. So, so they, they, they were taking a huge risk. Well, 4,500 years ago in Europe, you basically had no opportunity to own land. Unless, unless you were a, the son, son of a landowner, and probably, probably the first born son, son of a landowner, it just was not going to happen. You had no opportunity to improve your status. You were the same, same social, the same economic status you were born into, into was what you were going to be in for the rest of your life. Every, Every once in a while, a, a young, young man would fall in with a, fall in love with a girl of a higher status, status. But, but that, that marriage was extremely discouraged because, because dad did, did not want his little girl, girl marrying a common tradesman. I mean, I mean that, that was the worst thing in the world. So basically, you were stuck where you were. The, the occupation you were in, was basically limited to two. If you didn't want to do the same occupation your father did, so that he could teach that, you basically had to leave home at a very young age, go apprentice with someone else, and spend several years working for that man for free. So if we, if we make a scale or a continuum, um, if it was slavery on one end, and absolute freedom on the other end, I would, I would suggest, or guess that our ancestors had about that level of freedom. They, 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 they were not by any chance in bondage, bondage, but they, they had very, very limited choices about, about their destiny. Um, as, as opposed to that, that I would put our level of freedom on, on, up, up close to that, as we can. Uh, we are all, all accountable to somebody. We all have, have to obey laws. laws. We, but we, we can, can change, change that. that. If we, if if we, we want to move, move, change jobs, change our occupations, move, move across, across the country, country we have the option to do that. Whereas our ancestors four or five hundred years ago did not have those choices. But I believe they came simply because they wanted the opportunity to improve themselves. Some of you may remember a movie with uh, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kim and Nicole Arnway, Way, um, where they were basically Tom and Nicole's characters moved came to the United, United States. States. And, and when, when they, they were first met, met uh, Nicole Kim and showed Tom Cruise the flyers and said, they're, they're giving you land, land in America. In Tom Cruise's reaction was, nobody, nobody gives, gives away, away land. So this, so this was just unheard of in Europe, Europe that, that people would actually give you land and you could go own your own piece of property. That, that was just something that didn't happen. So they, 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 they wanted to prove things for themselves, but also they, they wanted to prove things to the children. children. But they knew, just, just like themselves, they knew that their children would not have 
any opportunity, opportunity at all. So that, that was, I believe, the reason why they were so motivated to come over to this country. Um, there's, there's some things that, that, that would be helpful, helpful if you could kind of keep, keep in the back of your mind while we're talking, talking about this. this. Um, the, the first is that migration equals transportation for the most part. We've, We've just seen how, how our ancestors were really motivated to get over here. here. So, so once, once they, they got, got to this country, they did not need a, a reason to, to go into the interior. They just needed the means to do that. So, so once the, the opportunity became available for them, them they, they took that, that opportunity and they, they traveled inward. Um, the, the other thing, thing to remember is that transportation technology developed in the Northeast. That's, that's where um, the, the foundries were, that's where, where the machine shops were, were that's where things, things were invented, the steamboats and, and the railroads were all developed in, in the Northeast United States. States. And, and as those things would develop, then they would move to the west and to the south. So, so everything was kind of started in the northeast and moved on to the rest of the country. And as the population grew, then the transportation developed. So, so like in 1630, the population along the eastern seaboard of the United States was about 7,000 people. You know, that, that was in the spread of that wide of area. They, they just were, were concentrating on surviving. How do we feed the kids, you know, you know, make ends meet, stay alive, and those sort of things. But by 1670, the population would run to 200,000. So, so then you get, get communities started, you have, have governments, and governments do projects like, like improve, improve the roads. roads. So, so as, as the population grew, the transportation grew with it. What, what conditions did they face when they got over here? Well, um, and, and I'm, I'm talking about a period, period like in the 1600s. 1600s. This, this one was a few main remaining virgin wars in the United States. And you can see a tree here about the size of a car. Um, all these are about the size of large people. There's a fall in log right here. Um, imagine coming to the edge of this with your wife and kids, and you had to go into this. I mean, this, this was going to be a lot of work to get through here. Um, you know, what's, what's lurking underneath all this underbrush? What's hiding down here in this hollow? Or who's, who's hiding behind, behind the tree saying, who are these people coming into my homeland? I didn't, I didn't ask them here. So, so there, there, was, there was a lot of natural barriers. And this went on for two or three hundred miles. miles. This, this wasn't was just, let's get through this real, real quick and then it would be over. over. This, this is a picture of the side, side of the road in Mississippi that I took in November. Imagine if each one of these saplings, oh, sorry, saplings here were the size of your leg. How, How hard, hard would that be to get through with an axe and a saw? I mean, I mean the, the, there was just a lot of barriers to, to, to uh, getting through. We, we have a report from uh, Benjamin Fletcher, who was the governor, governor of New York, York in 1694, and, and he was concerned about attacking the French in Canada, Canada coming down and attacking him in New York. York. So, so he sent out a reconnaissance patrol. And he, and he said, go tell me what the conditions, conditions were like and how, how the French might come, come down from Canada, Canada to, to eventually attack us. And, and his report came back and it said, it is impossible to march with any party of men to Canada by land, either in winter or summer, but that they must pass a considerable part of the way over a lake, the land on each side being extremely steep and rocky, with mountains or else a mere morass encumbered with underbrush, where men cannot go upright, but, but must, must, must creep, creep through bushes, bushes for whole day's marches, it, it being impossible for horses to go any time of year. So you, you can see, see this was, was, it was the natural barrier, just getting, getting through was considerable and much less all the other things they had to deal with. Which, which is why for about, about the first 100 years, nobody, nobody moved more than 25 or made it the most 50 miles inward from the coast. coast. It, it was just too hard for them. You, you can, can see, see a few places, places here, like little fingers, fingers that go in, and all, all these are up rivers. People, people would, would travel up the river, settle communities on the riverbanks, and, 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 and go, go in that, that way. But other than that, people just do not wish to brave the natural environment. environment. There were, however, trails that the Native Americans had been using for years. Um, and, and if those trails happened to go where you, where you wanted, wanted to go, go that, that would, you, you can take those. those. And, and they were, they they were, were simply narrow footpaths that we're not, not talking about a road here. We're talking about, about a narrow path, path where you could walk down. down. It's, it's interesting, interesting that many of those trails, trails fall, are on, on the same route that those are roads are today. 
One, one of the things that's, that's really neat about, about one of the books in your handout is the book by William Dollarhide. And, and he'll go in and he'll discuss um, a trail and tell you about a trail. And he'll, he'll say, oh, by the way, if you want to um, go down, down this trail, trail, you get on Interstate 20, you get on Interstate, Interstate 20, 20 to Highway 49, you take Highway 49 down south. So you, you can drive the same route that your ancestors might have driven, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, horses arrived in this country about the late 1600s. And obviously, obviously they, they could use the, the same trails that people did, and it, speed, it, it did speed up communications through, through um, the, the colonies. Rivers were a great um, method of travel because you could carry freight up and down the river. You could, if you came over with your spinning wheel and your grandmother's table or whatever, you could carry those things down the river a lot easier than you could down a little bit in there to the path to the forest. Um, there, there was basically four different kinds of uh, craft they used on the rivers. The first one was the dugout canoe because it was the easiest. They basically chopped down a tree, dug in the center out of it, which is why it's called the dugout canoe, and um, either with an axe or burning it, and you use that. The, the limitation of the dugout canoe was that it got very heavy if you got very big with it. If any of you have who have carried a tube of 12 around know, know that, that it can be heavy even though it's just a small piece of lumber. Um, because they would take the canoe out to the, to the walls are like an inch or two thick, but still it would be heavy as big as it was. So the, the second type of canoe that came along was the bark canoe. It was, they could make those much bigger because it was a lot lighter and they could carry it around better. Um, they would use either elk, uh, elk. Elm, elm bark, bark or, or birch, birch bark. bark and you, you can kind of see these little lines on the canoe that that, that, that was sap that they would seal the seeds with, with. so, so they, they can make this canoes a lot bigger to, to carry either like in this picture a larger number, number of people or that they wanted to carry freight and these, these were also used on the inland waterways like in the bays and as well as down up and down the rivers one of the most popular vehicles that, that was used on the river was the flat boat. boat. And, and the, the flat boat basically is a big rectangular box that you float down the river. It was a one-way craft. You floated it down the river, and you tore it apart, sold the lumber, and then walked or rode a horse back up the river to where, where you came from. The, the advantage of the, the flat boat was, for one, it has very tall, uh, not very tall, but pretty tall sides on it. So if you were floating down the river and you got attacked either by Indians or by pirates, you could crouch down behind those walls, and the walls were two or three inches thick. So it, it provided you a lot of protection from any enemy that might be trying to get to you. You could build a little room here in the center so you could get it out of the elements and away from the sun and the mosquitoes and the rain and all those things. And, and most people would build the room right in the middle of the, the, the boat and sit so back here in the back and they keep a few animals, a horse and a cow, something to help you get started when you got to the new home. And then you had a place for either carrying cargo or the family or passengers staying up front. And you can make these flat boats um, a lot bigger. This one, just judging from the picture, it looks like it's about 30 feet wide and over 100 feet long. So you can imagine you could put several bales of cotton or um, uh, bundles of tobacco or carrying a lot of livestock, whatever you had to carry, you could do a lot of it with a flat boat. The last major kind of river craft was the, what's called the keel boat. And, and some, some of you may remember, this is what Lewis and Clark used to make their exploration up the Missouri River. Uh, the keel boat had the advantage of being powered, it had a sail, so you could use the wind. But you'll notice this man standing right here with a big pole in his hand. The way that they would uh, propel the keel boat is several people would get up in front on each side, and you would walk back to the back of the craft. After, after you plunge that hole in the bottom of the river, that, that had the effect of moving the boat forward, and, and so you can move upstream as well as downstream with these keel boats. Obviously, the downstream wasn't hard, it was upstream that was the, the, the difficult part. The, the first roads that, when, when we say improved roads and when we say road in general, I know when, when we say road, we think of something to drive the car on. The, the first improved roads, roads were actually just paths that, 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 that were for horse, horse, horses or for foot traffic. And, and the first one um, that, that was done corporately was the Boston Post Road. road. 
and, and it was a road that connected Boston with New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore. Um, just, just to be able to get mail back and forth between um, those cities. And see, King Charles II decided he wanted that road. If you'll remember when the colonies first started, they were all British, but they were separate individual entities. So they didn't necessarily communicate with each other that well. So King Charles decided he wanted a way for them to communicate back and forth. They were not wide enough for wagons or coaches until about 1740 or 1750. So for about 100 years, it was just a trail running along the coast. Um, by 1776, it became known as the King's Highway, and it, was a, it did become a wagon road um, all the way from Maine to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, any kind of water crossings, and there were quite a few, were mostly by ferry. There were, there were a few bridges built, but mostly it was ferry crossings across the different waterways. And it was really subject to weather. If you had a lot of rain, it could very easily wash that bridge out because they weren't very well constructed, or it could wash the ferry away. And if you came up to one of those crossings and the ferry was gone or the bridge was washed out, you had to sit there and wait until they rebuilt it or swim across, whichever was your choice. If some of the rivers were a mile across, a lot of times you wouldn't do the swimming. Um, we have a record of a German family who came from North Carolina to Pennsylvania in 1745. And they came, when they came up to the river, they said, on the side from which we approached, there is a high sandy bank, and the wheels of the wagon sank down to the axle in the sand, and were freed only after one and one half hours of work with levers and extra horses. It then took two more hours to get their pa the pair of wagons and three riding horses across the river by means of the ferry. They, they considered this quite lucky for fr frequently travelers are detained here for an entire day. So you can see travel was not a quick experience at all or easy experience. But by 1750, we began to get a network of roads along the East Coast. I mean, people were, were coming over to America rapidly. They would move inland. You know, you know form a community, community. They, they wanted a way to get back and forth between, between the different towns, and so they would build a trail, and then that would turn into a road. This is a um, stagecoach lines fair or a schedule from about the mid 1700s. Um, you can see it took to get from Boston to Savannah, Georgia, it took 22 and a half days. Um, if you were to ride that by car today, it would take you 14 to 15 hours. So, um, it wasn't, they didn't have, hey, honey, let's, you couldn't be in Boston and say, hey, honey, let's jump in the car, drive down to New York City and see a play. The, you know, that, it was, if you were in Boston and go to New York, it took you four days. So, it was not a quick um, way to get around, which is probably why a lot of our ancestors stayed in the same town they were born in, because it was just too hard to travel back and forth. After the Revolutionary War, and we, the country started to settle down and grow, um, New Orleans became a, a, an important port for us. Even though at first it wasn't even United States territory, we had a lot of people settling up here along the Ohio Valley and in Kentucky, and when they would produce whatever goods they would produce, instead of having to trek, haul them back over the Appalachian Mountains, they would ship them down river to New Orleans. And it, at the time, it took us about a month to get a letter from Washington, D.C. down to New Orleans. So Thomas Jefferson decided that was too long. And so he, he began the process of building the Federal Horse Path. And the Federal Horse Path took up where the King's Highway left off, and it would travel all the way down to New Orleans. When the War of 1812 was starting to approach, um, not only did New Orleans become our territory with the Louisiana Purchase, but we, when things started to get uneasy with the British, our military began to realize that with the British's superior navy, they could sail down around Florida, come up to Mississippi, and invade the United States from the interior. And that worried them. So they came down, and that's when the uh, Federal Horse Path really began to improve the road, because the military wanted a way to get 
troops and supplies down that road. So they came in and, and started improving that and making it an actual wagon road. Many of you have heard of the Natchez Trace. The Natchez Trace is the trail that um, after, after people would come down the Mississippi with their flatboats, they would walk or ride back up the Natchez Trace. And the military did the same thing with the Natchez Trace. They decided they wanted to be able to get troops and equipment down from Tennessee, so they improved that road as well at that time. So we're fixing to jump into a new chapter. Does anybody have any questions about trails or road or, or, or river travel? Um, okay. Man. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Are they out on the table? There's none left. Um, if you'll give me or Todd your email address, I'll make sure you get one. Yeah, okay. Great. Yes, sir. So, uh, I may have guessed this, but how long did it take for uh, uh, ships to go from Europe to uh, uh, America? If, if everything went well, it, it took about seven, seven weeks. weeks. Seven weeks. If, if you, you ran into a storm and got blown off course, it could be three months. And, and there's actual, actual actually there was lots of stories about how ship's captains would carry extra food with them. them. And if the ship got blown off course, there would be a lot of passengers, especially female passengers, that would run out of food. And you can guess what they did with their extra food. So there was a lot of, a lot of bad stuff going on in that voyage. It just was not nice. Um, it's not something you would want to do over spring break, believe me. Yes. I'm sorry. I don't know what the equivalent, I did, but I do know it would be a lot of money. It would be a lot of money. So, yes, ma'am. What would it cost for the trip across the ocean? I'm really not sure. Um, I know a lot of people that came across could not afford it at all, and that's where the indentured servants came in, and that's a whole other story. I think Bill Covington talked about that last month, how and a lot of times people would get on the boat and they would basically sell themselves to the ship's captain and when they got over to america the ship's captain people would leave, make them stay on that boat um, even after they traveled all that time over here and they would wait for people to come from the town they were in to come say we well, you know you you can you can come work for me so i mean they would they would leave europe not knowing how long is it going to take to get here, not knowing what they were going to be doing when they get here? You know, it was just a, it wasn't good. <laughs> it just wasn't. Okay, steam. We had steam travel um, develop about this time. Now, when I was in school, my teacher told me that Robert Fulton invented the steamship in 1807. Did anybody else? They lied to us. <laughs> But the first steamship was invented by John, John Fitch in 1786, not, not even 10 years after the Revolutionary War, War ended. But you know what? what? Nobody was interested. It went nowhere. I mean, he would pitch it to the U.S. Congress. He pitched it to state legislatures. Nobody really cared. Um, we have a, a diary that was kept about a, a man named Oliver Evans. And, and after John, shortly after John Fitch invented the first steamboat, several other people were, were building these and trying to get licenses for them. And the legislatures listened to Oliver Evans with tolerance and some interest while the inventor explained the principles of this grain mill, which was powered by steam, by a steam engine. But when he began to discuss a vehicle designed to move along roads by its own power and mechanism, their patience came to an end, and a belief arose that Evans's mental capacity was becoming severely impaired. They thought the guy was crazy. How could, why would you want a steam engine that would carry you upriver or carry you along a road? That was just dumb. And I, I still don't, yeah, I've read several books, and, and nobody really can say why the public was, did not catch on to this, because obviously steam travel revolutionized migration and travel in the world, but anyway. This is a bottle of John, the last steam engine that John Fitch built, and you'll see in a minute that it looks a whole lot like 
the, the rail, first railroad cars that were built 30 or 40 years later. But again, no one was interested, so he moved to Kentucky and retired, and no one ever heard from him again. This is the Claremont, this is the steamship that Robert Fulton did build in 1807, and it was the first commercially viable steamship in the United States. He traveled from, he carried passengers and freight from Albany, New York to New York City up the Hudson River, and he did very well with it. Um, they, and they branched out, and once people saw that they could chug upstream at a blazing speed of five to six miles an hour, it just took off. And they started building more steam engines and they would improve them and it just progressed. Yes, sir. It was a huge amount of money. So, so steam travel took off, uh, obviously. This is the picture from about 1930, and you can see this steamboat here looks more like what the typical boat we think of. And it's carrying a, a lot of freight down here at the bottom, and then there's a small area for passengers on top. And you'll notice back here behind this steamboat, there's a ocean going, an ocean liner. It's also travel powered by steam. Um, a little bit off topic, but what we were talking about, about the, sa the sailing vessels crossing the ocean, it was that way up until about 1830, and they started using steam for ocean travel, and then it revolutionized transatlantic shipping. Until then, it was just a miserable experience. Oops, wrong button. Um, and then about 1850, this was the si this is what it looked like in every major city along the river in the country. We had various types of steamboats traveling up and down the river, um, carrying produce and freight um, across the country. The first railroads, believe it or not, were powered by horses. About the time Robert Fulton was building his steamship, um, a man named Leeper building a, built the first railroad in Pennsylvania. He owned a, a gravel quarry, and he built a small railroad to, to pull the gravel and the rock from where he was mining it and pulverizing it to the place he was selling it. And it was pulled by horses. He, they just figured out that a horse could pull a lot larger load over rails than they could over a, a wagon or with a wagon over a road. Horses really took off, or railroads really took off um, in cities, and we would call them trolley cars today. But you can see how these two little bit scrawny horses are pulling this big car full of people um, because they can, they just roll easier over rails. So, but about 1830s, um, they started putting steam engines in the railroad cars. So that's when railroads started taking off. This is one of the first railroads. Um, it was called the Tom Thumb. And you notice how this car looks a whole lot like Robert Fulton's steam engine 40 years earlier. And you have a, a, a single piston engine right in the middle, and it's powered by coal, which is kept in a bin that you can't see real well here. But it basically just pulled a car, and you could put passengers or freight or whatever you wanted to in the car. And people came up with some really ridiculous looking things. Um, they had stagecoaches around, so they figured, we'll just put different wheels on the stagecoaches and use them to carry people. Um, and then they had a little, in this particular one, they had a little bitty car with, with some cargo in it. So there were some really, the, if you look at some pictures um, of railroads during this early time, it's some really interesting looking things. This is a railroad that was built in Mississippi, of all places, in, 18, in the late 1830s. When, when railroads first developed, um, they didn't have the vision of railroads traveling all across the country like we have now. They built them for specific purposes. This is a, a short railroad that was built in Mississippi by the Tatum Lumber Company, and they used it for hauling logs to the um, mill to saw them up and then hauling the lumber to the town where they could sell it. And, but this does look more like what we think of as a locomotive engine as opposed to some of the others. And then by the 1850s, this looks, you might think this is a highway map across New England, but this is actually a railroad map. All these colored lines are different railroads crossing, crisscrossing the Northeast. 
And then by the 1870s, it was starting to move down into our part of the country. You can't see it as well, but every time you see one of these hatched lines like this, that's a railroad line. And it's interesting because, like, for example, down here in Louisiana, you would have a line going from Monroe through Vicksburg to Jackson, but then it stopped in Monroe. And then you'd have another one picking up here in Shreveport and taking up in East Texas. So while it was not completely developed yet, we did have railroads starting in our part of the country in the 1870s. So how did my ancestors get here? If I, if I have no evidence at all to tell me how they might have arrived, how can I hypothesize or make an, es an educated guess about how they might have gotten here? Well, you need to ask yourself a few questions. The first question to ask is what time, when, what year did they come um, make the, the journey? Because that's going to make a large, large difference is how they travel. Um, the second thing to ask is how much money did they have to spend? Was it a man and his wife that had just newly married and they were wanting to move to a new property to start a new life together? Or was it a man that had gotten established that had maybe had some property to sell and had more money to spend for the journey? So that made a big difference as well. Who was in the party they were traveling with? Was it a man, like, we, like I just said, was it a man and his wife? Or was it a family or a group of families? Sometimes several, three or four family units that were related would make this trip together. So that's important to know when you're looking at how they might have traveled. In 1803, Thomas Rodney was appointed territorial judge and land commissioner for the new territory of Mississippi. Now, Thomas Rodney was spending my ancestor and your ancestors tax dollars. So he had all the money he needed to get that, make this journey. So I'm going to assume that he made the journey the easiest and the fastest way possible, since he didn't have to pay for it himself. So what he, he left us a nice book that is a detailed journey of, a detailed record of his travels. What he did is he started here in Delaware, and he took the Lancaster Road across Pennsylvania um, to the Ohio River. And then he floated down the Ohio River after building a boat and floated all the way down the Mississippi to Natchez. The whole trip took him three and a half months. The overland portion through here took him about five weeks. But he made it down there, and actually he made it one day before the court started, so uh, he made it on time. My third great-grandfather, Joshua Seal, and his wife, Ellender, along with six adolescent children, the oldest one being 12 years old, came from Anson County, North Carolina, to Marion County, Mississippi in 1810. Now, Joshua Seal's father was Charles, was what was termed a planter, which means he had lots of land, probably lots of slaves, but he had money also. I also know that Joshua sold 400 acres of land in North Carolina in the spring of 1810 before he left. So he had some money to spend. So he had three choices that how to get down here. The first would be to travel to the coast, probably to Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, travel down around the Florida Peninsula up to the Gulf to New Orleans and then make the trip over to Mississippi. Um, at this time, like we had mentioned, sea travel was not any better than it was 100 years before. So I'm guessing that he did not do that to his kids and his wife. His second option would be to travel across South Carolina, pick up the Federal Road, and travel down the Federal Road to Mississippi, which ironically, the Federal Road came very close to where he eventually settled, so it would have been a shorter trip for him. But in 1810, this area right here was controlled by the Creek and Choctaw nations. So sometimes they liked us, sometimes they didn't like us. So I can't imagine taking my wife and six little kids down through that area, not to mention the Indians there, but what about the wolves and the bears and all that, and trying to corral the kids together. His other option would be to start off here in Anson County and make a 200-mile trip over to the Holston River in um, northeastern Tennessee. Then he could travel down the Tennessee River, across over to the Mississippi, down the Mississippi to New Orleans, or actually probably to Natchez, where he would move over. 
That is what I'm going to estimate. That's what. I, that's my story. That's what I'm sticking with until someone proves me wrong. I have no proof. I don't know that at all. But I think that's that's what I would have done if I'd have been his in his position. Another thing you can do is use census analysis to help you determine um, how they came. If you ha say have an ancestor that was living in New York, and then all of a sudden the next census you find them down in Texas. Look at where their children were born during those years. If they had a child born in, in Iowa, well, you know how they got here. I mean, I'm sorry, Ohio. You know how they got here. They got here down river. They traveled down the eastern side of the Appalachian Mountains till they hit a major river and came down to the Mississippi. However, if they have a child born in Massachusetts, well, that tells you how they got here as well. They took a boat all the way around here down south and up to New Orleans. So that can, that can give you a lot of insight if you know where they might have stopped on, along the way. Here we have the census. This census is from, I believe, 1860. We have Leonard Thompson and his wife Elizabeth who were born in North Carolina. And his first two children were born in Alabama and his last newborn child is from Texas. So how do you think he, they came down here? Anybody? Federal Road, exactly. We don't know if they, if they, their destination was Texas or if their destination was Alabama and then they moved on. Because a lot of people during this time period would move on to a piece of property, farm it till it was exhausted, had no nutrients left, and then they would move on to another piece of property. And at the time, Texas was giving away property to anybody who wanted it. So that might have been their destination. This is an 1880 census from a a family named the Germanskis. Um, they had five kids. Three of them were born in Germany, and two of them were born in Texas. How do you think they got here? Probably so. They probably came into Galveston or New Orleans on a steam line. Remember, 1880, steamships were in wide route, wide use. The trip probably took a couple of weeks instead of three months, and so this probably w was the way they came over. So, what do we want to take away from our time here this morning? Uh, the first thing to remember is our ancestors were highly motivated to migrate throughout the country. If they had the gumption to get on that boat and endure that journey, they did not need any reason or any prompting to migrate across the country. All they needed was the means to do so. And that's why as my migration occurred, as transportation developed, as soon as those opportunities came available for them, they took advantage of them. Oh, sorry. Um, and then track your ancestors' probable migration by asking a few questions. When did they come over? How much money did they have to spend? Who was traveling in the group? And where might they have stopped along the way? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have we, have we got any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, during the travel on board the ship, seven weeks, three months, what were the passengers doing during the day? Were they allowed to get on deck? Did they just I'm, I'm sure they were allowed to get on deck, but that was it. You could, either, you, could, you could walk up on deck and look around and look at miles and miles and miles of water, or you could stay down in your cabin, which was very small cabin. So that's why that's for, for me that would be one of the worst things about the trip is the absolute boredom. And a lot when you read about these trips and the journals of these trips, that's mentioned a lot is the absolute boredom of weeks and weeks and weeks with nothing to do. So it was just I mean I can't overemphasize it was just a bad deal. Okay, thank you guys. Oh yes, sir. One more question: How many people would typically be on that ship? Fifty or? Usually around 100 to 150. Um, like I say, the ships were only a couple hundred feet long, so there wasn't a lot of room. And I'm sure these those berths were like two or three wide in the ship, but still, that I mean, I counted it up, and you could only fit like maybe 100, 150 people in there. And like I say, it depended on how much money you had as to as to how many people were sleeping in your bunk. I mean, you could be sharing that with four people, so. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Have you done any research on um, wagon train migration across the country? 
across the South? No, no I have not. Um, like I say, my all, and the reason I started this was because this is the way my ancestors came down. It was, it was all down along that southern route, and so I just kind of, it just kind of snowballed, and I kind of learned more and more and more about it. So I hope to learn about that one day, but it's a journey. Yes. Um, my family is a little interesting. They came from North Carolina. Uh -huh. My fourth great grandfather was white. He had nine children with slave women. I mean, they. And they, they wound up in Louisiana and then in Nacogdoches. So would, would they have come, do you think, maybe over land, or would they have come by boat? If they were in Louisiana, I would bet they came by boat down the river. And then there's a, a road from uh, Natchitoches, Louisiana, over to Nacogdoches and on to San Antonio called the Camino Real, which was a very popular, very well-traveled road um, during, like, the early 1800s. Um, and they probably would have use that route to get from Louisiana back over to Texas. That would be my guess. And again, you know, without any kind of evidence to tell you for sure where they were, these are all just guesses and hypotheses and educated guesses, but still guesses. Yes, sir. Okay, coming over here, you had four people to the bunk and crowded ships. What about going back? When we're going back, they didn't have near as many passengers as they had, had because obviously people were immigrating to the United States. I know there were diplomats probably that were going back over to Europe to, you know, serve the country and things like that. And of course the crew would go with the boat, but it wasn't near as crowded as it was, you know, coming over. I was gonna say, I had ancestors who came from Scotland, from Liverpool into New Orleans, and then the boat would take cotton back. Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, it, they would, they would clear all whatever furniture and stuff that was out and fill the, the whatever space they had with freight. So that's true. I mean, I, I didn't think about that, but they were, because we were, I mean, we were producing things in the colonies, whether it be cotton or tobacco or whatever, and they would send all those things back. Yes, ma'am. What would be the most likely route from Illinois down into Hunt County, Texas area, right in really? the 1850s, 1860s? Oh, okay. so there what was it? River. Um, flat boats were used up until the 1880s, uh, and and you wouldn't you wouldn't think people would use them that long after steamships were became popular. But there was I found lots of pictures of steamships and flat boats flooding down flooding down the river next to each other. So I guess they were just uh, we had lots of wood, and it was just easier to build a tree than it was to pay someone on a, I mean, build a boat out of lumber than it was to pay the freight freight for a steamship. So, yes. I have uh, some ancestors that came through, uh, I believe came through New Orleans, uh, 1830s, 1840s. What resources are available to, to look at passenger lists and things like that for that time period? <laughs> I know there are some passenger lists for New Orleans on the uh, Family Search website. I haven't really looked into them in detail. Um, I would, I would, I always start with Google. That's my go-to search engine for genealogy or anything else. And you'd be surprised how much you can find. Another thing that might could help you out is if you go to Google Books, um, you can find a lot of older Google Books that were written like around uh, the turn of the century, around 1900. That will, a lot of times will tell you those things you need to know. Um, so I would I would try with Google and search from there, and then look on Family Search, not not in the search the records part, but go to the catalog part and search the catalog. Yes. The, uh, the Galveston Historical Museum has some port of entry lists. Yeah. yeah. Also online. Yeah. yeah. Um, searching the state that you're interested in is going to help too, but again, I would start with Google and see what Google can find for you. Okay, I thank y'all very much. This has been a presentation of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. Your membership dues are supporting this and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, I hope you consider joining. You can become a member for as little as $35 a year, and you can join by going to our website, dallasgenealogy.org, and clicking on the membership tab.